Hi, I'm Bill Babcock with Expert Amateur. I didn't really want to do another video on lightning. I've already done two blog posts and two videos on the subject, but there seems to be so much confusion about lightning protection, I think I need to do a simplified one. Most clouds are electrically charged, almost all of them. Uh, but in a lightning storm cloud, the positive and negative charges get separated, usually by thousands of feet. So the intensity of the charges built up can be immense. When you see a lightning flash inside a cloud, that means the separation wasn't enough uh, for the amount of charge. Um, the charge is contained in small ice crystals being carried up by updrafts while a soft hail called Graupel, uh, I think, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, drifts downward. Uh, so collisions between the rising ice crystals and the following Graupel um, result in a charge transfer by a mechanism called non-inductive charging. So the ice crystals become positively charged and the Graupel is negatively charged at the lower parts of the cloud. Of course, there's lots of other details, but that's close enough. Positive on top, negative on the bottom. That strong negative charge at the bottom of the cloud induces a positive charge in the ground. And that gets concentrated in a relatively small area underneath the cloud. When the charge builds enough, um, then a negative charge called a discharge, called a stepped leader, extends downward from the cloud, ionizes the air, and makes it conductive. When it gets close to the ground, it induces upward streamers from tall objects like trees or buildings. Uh, these streamers carry a positive charge upward, and when the step ladder or leader and the upward streamer meet, there's a complete com conductive channel formed, and, uh, and the negative charges stream down the conductive path. And then a huge return stroke flows positive charge upwards. That's why they always say lightning actually strikes upwards. Um, the air around the plasma channel heats to about 30,000 degrees centigrade, which is about the temperature of the photosphere of the sun. Um, and it explodes outward, and that makes the shock wave we call thunder. So we have a lightning bolt with an electromagnetic wave along its length, spreading out through the, and that electromagnetic wave spreads out through the air. And then there's also a wave spreading out from the area where the lightning bolt originated. Both of them are staggeringly powerful, but both diminish pretty rapidly as they travel away from the origin, roughly as the square of the distance traveled. So let's say here's your solar equipment sitting there fat, dumb, and happy about a thousand yards from the lightning bolt. The racks and the frames are a reasonably good antenna, and they soak up that pulse in the air. Um, and they create a resultant current that flows. If you have a local earth ground at the array, that current takes a direct path, uh, the path of least resistance straight to the earth ground. So it's gone. You don't have to, you don't, if you don't have a local ground, the discharge path is through the equipment ground conductor to the service entrance ground. And um, that's a safe path, but unfortunately that massive current induces voltage and, and current into your equipment through the ground path. And anything that can't handle um, the resulting voltage spike is damaged or destroyed. So yes, Mr. Mike Holt is quite right. The equipment ground will conduct the induced voltage to the service entrance ground. Unfortunately, uh, your equipment will probably be toast for any kind of reasonably close strike. But if you have a ground rod at the array, you still have a problem. You have two earth grounds. And remember, there's a ground wave that's spreading out. So the, the local um, at, ground at the array and the service entrance ground um, pick up that, that ground wave and, and, a, and, a, and there's a potential induced between them that, that is um, determined by the resistance between them. And, you know, the, dirt, the ground is reasonably high resistance. It depends on how wet it is and other conditions. But, but um, 
but there's a voltage induced between those two ground rods that's, a, that's roughly equivalent to uh, a ratio of the, of the distance between the two ground rods and the distance from the point of origin of the, of the ground wave to the furthest ground rod. So, so that can be a, a great big huge voltage and uh, the current flows from the highest potential ground rod to the lowest, lots of current. And yes, it's still just current in the ground conductors, but it also forms electromagnetic waves inside your equipment that induce current in every conductor nearby. So your sensitive electronics are still toast. Uh, but if you trench between your ground rods and bond them together with some, um, uh, as I did, with some bare six gauge copper wire, um, then the resistance between your ground rods is probably less than an ohm. So there's no huge voltage drop across that low resistance. So not much voltage and hardly any current flows up through your equipment ground conductor. Now how safe your gear is depends on how close that strike was and how powerful it was. If it was too close or too powerful, then even that low resistance of the ground of the bonding wire becomes significant. But even without that current coming up from the ground rods, your equipment has a, a current induced into it just from that electromagnetic field radiating from the bolt. And that can be more than enough to slag all the active components in the gear. Uh, fortunately, a lightning stroke strike is a local phenomenon that spreads out from the source and therefore weakens quickly. So if you're much more likely to have to deal with a, with a lightning strike, say a thousand yards up to maybe half a mile away from your gear, than, uh, than by a, a direct strike. A direct strike is gonna be incredibly rare, whereas if you live in a high lightning area, um, a, a strike within that distance of say a thousand yards up to out to a half a mile is going to happen. So um, and it's going to be fairly common. So um, having a quick, having something having a solution that deals with that is valuable. So um, so you might think uh, you know what about surge protection devices? Uh, you know if I put in some lightning arresters as they're called. Um, won't that solve the problem? Well, they'll certainly help with uh, with surges on the input and output. Um, you know, they sit on the input to your device or on the output also. And when an overvoltage spike appears, uh, they trigger and short it to ground. And the technical term is clamping, meaning they conduct like crazy when the voltage reaches some amount that your equipment can probably survive if it's short pulse. So like maybe 600 volts. And then they stop conducting when the voltage drops below that trigger level. The, the, but the value of, of SPDs in dealing with lightning is pretty limited because remember the, the, the biggest, one of the biggest problems is there's, there's a current induced into your ground, um, your system ground. And your SPD is trying to connect your input to the system ground. So they don't do anything about the high current running through that system ground, and they can't. Um, so so their, their protection is limited. Um, that it doesn't mean that they're not worthwhile. There's, there's, lots of, um, there's lots of spikes, voltage spikes on the input um, from other sources. But, um, so to me, the best bet seems to be keeping those massive currents out of your equipment to begin with. Solar flares, you know, people are starting to get concerned about solar flares. They're a different challenge. The last big one was about 11 years ago, and that's the length of a typical cycle. So if the cycle stays true to its usual schedule, we're due for another fairly, you know, maybe a big one, nobody knows how big, probably in June of 2025. So. You can expect a marketing blitz once that starts to become, you know, newsworthy, um, and the blitz will be selling ineffective or unnecessary protection. Uh, uh, solar people are aware of solar flares because they've taken down entire grids before, but that's mainly because they can saturate and damage utility transformers and do other and do damage to other utility equipment. 
they don't they haven't historically really done much damage to consumer electronics it would probably be a really good time to have an independent power source but um, but trying to protect against solar flares with a SPD or some other device is probably it it probably won't do much and it's probably a, much more the grid's problem than it is yours um, I don't know much about EMP. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people concerned about EMPs and their solar equipment. Personally, um, I'm not particularly worried about my equipment surviving a nearby nuclear explosion. I expect I'll have a lot of other issues to worry about if that happens. But anyway, this is getting too long. Uh, if you feel I've let, left something out, let me know in the comments. I'm not gonna do another one of these videos. This, I've talked about lightning enough. But if you think I'm clueless, please correct me. We can talk about it in the comments section. Um, and I am absolutely capable of being wrong, but um, I, I do a fair amount of research to do these videos, and I think I'm close. So anyway, I'm working on blog posts right now about uh, monitoring your electrical consumption precisely so that you can tune up your solar installation to really suit your needs. And um, I'm ripping apart some PV disconnect switches and breakers to see what makes them capable of interrupting high voltage and making sure that they've actually got guts in that actually will do something. And I've taken a look at my uh, legacy system here in Maui. Um, it's got the, the racking in that system has been uh, surviving through several nearby hurricanes and the typical high uh, Maui winds for uh, about 12 years and um, and, if, and if you looked at that racking um, and I'll show you it um, you would think wow that's pretty wimpy to be able to handle that uh, so it's interesting to see what actually racking can be like if it's well designed and well um, well reinforced with just reasonable engineering practices so anyway um, that's about it for this video and until we until you see you next next time um, be safe and if you find this kind of technical content valuable then please uh, subscribe and and like the post it, it helps and it's nice to see thanks bye